Okay, well, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us for this pre-concert conversation. My name is Merwin Sue. I'm a violinist with the orchestra, also the artistic administrator, and I'm delighted to be joined by two amazing people, um, our music director, Alain Trudel, Hello. and our special guest, also a violinist, also a violinist from Canada, actually, Timothy Chewy. Mm -hmm. We're so excited to be presenting this program that really delves into the romantics and the romanticism that comes from Russian music. And we're actually going to start with the last piece on the program, which is Prokofiev's Second Violin Concerto. And mm -hmm. just an amazing piece of music, one of the most amazing beginnings of a violin concerto, because the soloist doesn't have to worry about the second violins, he just has to worry <laughs> about himself. So, Timothy, uh, maybe do you want to talk about the maybe just those very first um, very first notes of that Prokofiev second? Thanks for having me here, Warren. Um, this is a really interesting concerto in the sense that uh, it is so haunting to begin at the at the start of this piece. So so often um, concertos before Prokofiev, it always started with some sort of um, some sort of introduction, interlude. Prokofiev starts it with just a very simple G minor arpeggio and the violin plays solo, almost that that's the cadenza of the piece um, at the beginning. And um, it's it creates a really intense mood, I think, for the entire hall. Absolutely. There's no sense of kind of like, oh, well, we can kind of ease our way into this. You're immediately drawn into the spotlight. So, um, Alain, have you had a chance to conduct this piece before? Many times. It's one of my favorite violin concerto. One of my favorite concerti, actually. And that beginning, so, si, ré, mi, do, ré, so, si, ré, it's really haunting. I think the chromatism in it, ré, di, da, di, da, di, da, di, da, da. And it really, it's, it draws the audience, it draws everybody into this tiny little space. You know, it's almost a, feel almost uh, not claustrophobic, but it draws you into this little space where there's only one person there. And it's like the concert, it's a very cinematographic, not in the sense that it sounds like film music. It just, you know, the sense of perspective, many, few, you know, like we have a, a little bit like Eisenstein, you know, so it has that sense that for me, it's incredible. And of course, I have my favorite part in it, but maybe I can tell you later. I was wondering how it felt to abdicate the responsibility of setting the tempo. I mean, you don't you don't get any choice. You have to go with the you have to go with the soloist tempo. That's got to be really unusual for you. Obviously, you're not a conductor. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever tempo you do doesn't matter. <laughs> you start and it's funny, you know those starts. I mean. It's like when you start um, uh, when you know, Sibelius concerto, you go, <laughs> it doesn't really matter because solo starts and it's that tempo, you know. But at the same time, you know, you, you rehearse together, you already have an idea. You're in the same ballpark, you know. But uh, actually, um, to, to give you a real answer, it makes it quite easy <laughs> because you already know, you know, where you're going. And, uh, and the, the tempo, uh, what's the, I'd say, the uh, not hardest but the, the the place that's more touchy and is the beginning of the second movement to make sure that you have exactly the right tempo if you go too slow the soloist is like this there's no place to go and uh, you, you have to think you don't want to run out of bow you don't want to run up at the wrong place and also just the idea of the phrase you know so it's not it's not an adagio a molto and it's a it just it needs to flow a little bit so that's the big challenge for the conductor i'd say in this piece and just making sure to keep everybody together in that that last moment you know when there's a the big the big licks at the same time as the orchestra but it's uh but fortunately and unfortunately well only unfortunately i don't get to do it with you guys today but well, uh but 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 someday uh, uh tim and i will will, will do it yeah, but you're, actually, something else here. you're spoiling this for him you should be letting timothy discover all of this because actually this is your first time playing this concerto with orchestra. So maybe, Timothy, if I could ask you, um, is there something kind of like a special nerves or a special energy that you get when you're kind of making your debut with a concerto? Absolutely. Um, 
you know, playing a concerto for the first time with an orchestra is a really exciting process because that is the icebreaker that needs to be done in order to build the development of a piece. So, um, you know, I think this is the best situation in some ways because we have a lot of rehearsals before uh, the concert itself. And um, it's a piece that needs a lot of rehearsals to begin with, I think, um, for, for both sides to get used to. Because I think um, Prokofiev orchestral parts are very, very deceivingly tricky. Um, and, uh, and I think it's going to just be uh, beneficial for both of us. So for me, the, the special energy that comes in is just real excitement. And uh, I, I think this piece is amazing in the sense of how he thought of the symphonic aspect of it and blending it with the solo violin it's, it's really a unique sound that he creates a huge sound world that i think um for me at least when i first heard it just drew me into a brand new language of, of a concerto it's one of the amazing things about prokofiev is um in a way almost kind of following in the steps of somebody like rimsky korsakov using very normal orchestral forces and in fact, relatively pared down forces, and which is one of the reasons why we're doing this particular concerto is in this kind of COVID-19 landscape. It is one of the orchestras that we can fit on stage and yet somehow achieving this huge variety of sounds. And so maybe Elena, if you could speak to like some of the ways that, you know, like he just uses all of these different textures to create very, very different moods. Uh, this concerto, I mean, this is textbook orchestration for a violin concerto because you need, uh, well, first of all, the soloist needs to be heard, but at the same time, the orchestra needs to feel that you can actually play. You don't have to always like, oh, you know, the, with the violin, uh, especially especially of the stature of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Timothy, is that, you know, it will be heard, don't worry. <laughs> Even if, uh, you know, when it, we play too loud, doesn't matter, it will be heard. But, you know, you can you can write in a way that everybody feels comfortable soloist orchestra everybody feels comfortable nobody's doing any compromise and everything works and this is one of the the rare concertos uh, i give you an example that's exactly the contrary tchaikovsky <laughs> tchaikovsky is like you know you have to uh, tone it down a lot here and there not the second movement when you get to the in that first movement it gets big i mean he writes down, I mean, he's a genius, right? We're talking in the same, they're all geniuses. Eh? But you really have to watch it. The last moment of um, of Sibelius also, you really have to watch the, the sound of the orchestra, not to get in the way of the solos. But Kofiev, everybody's playing out, no problem. It sounds great. And that's because, of course, he uses the forces he needs for that. So he did away with the low brass. There's a very little brass, but it's like a spice, you know? You absolutely taste it when and where you're supposed to taste it you know the second violin concerto it feels like you just put it on the stand plate it's it's not true you really have to practice but for the orchestra you put it there you play it you don't have to think too much ask yourself question the music all it's all thought of before and the, the the genius of Pokofiev comes out through it's a really really difficult solo part but you know but for the orchestra we have moments but basically it's it's all there and it's really rare and the concerto Somebody takes that kind of care, but that's Prokofiev. And Prokofiev, and uh, Timothy will tell you that, Prokofiev does not write patterns. It's never the same thing twice. And that drives everybody crazy. But that's one thing that makes it very special. So uh, all composers write patterns. Prokofiev does not write pattern. It's, there's always a, a little thing different, or it goes the other way around and all that. Keeps your interest, keeps the uh, audience interest uh, as well. Very, very special composer. So um, Alain mentioned uh, kind of these kind of Prokofiev tendencies and Prokofiev wrote just enough for the violin, enough to get like all of these different, you know, enough to get these tendencies, like, you know, a couple of beautiful violin and piano sonatas, a solo violin sonata and the first violin concerto, which is some of my favorite music. But have you had a ch had you, have you had a chance to explore a lot of Prokofiev outside the second concerto, or is this was was this maybe the last Prokofiev that you had done, or is this one of the first pieces? I really love Prokofiev's music. I've been playing it since uh, since I was really young. I started with the um, March of the Three Oranges, uh, and I think that was when I was like eight or something. I just remember how quirky it was, and I love that. Maybe I'm quirky myself a little bit, but 
I also have played his violin sonata for two uh, sonata for two violins, and I play that with my brother a lot, who's also a violinist. I learned the first violin concerto um, when I was very young. I never got a chance to play with orchestra, and uh, also just remember watching a recording of Hilary Hahn and just really loving the way that she um, has actually approached that concerto, and she's played it many many times since. I also played this uh, violin sonatas, and this is kind of I would say is actually the last of the Prokofiev. Uh, standard repertoire that I am learning and I'm so happy because I get to see a huge trajectory of how his music has evolved and which parts of his writing and composition has changed and which part hasn't changed. And there's a lot of things that haven't changed actually, it's it's really interesting. Um, and just, um, yeah, for me that's, uh, it's been a journey with Prokofiev's music. So I want to do a tiny sidebar because you mentioned that your brother is a violinist. We uh, certainly, Elena and I are uh, familiar with it. Do you ever get to play first violin for the two violin sonata, or does because he's the older brother, does he always get to be first violin? Do you <laughs> do you rock scissors paper over it? How does that work? That's a great question, and we did talk about that one time. But with that piece, it's it's really confusing once you learn one part and learn the other part <laughs> because. <laughs> I think that's more of the reason why we don't switch around than um, than the actually f uh, actual fighting of who's gets to be first and who's gets to be second. Um, but maybe one day. <laughs> awesome, wonderful. It's funny we've put we've used a lot of different adjectives. We've talked about haunting. We've talked about quirky, and yeah, we put this pro this piece on a program of Russian romantics, and there actually are some really kind of hard on sleeve romantic mm -hmm. moments in this concerto that maybe you don't expect if you're if we're just using words like haunting and brooding and quirky. Could we maybe talk about some of those kind of really hardened sleeve romantic moments that maybe audiences can look forward to enough? You know, I'm thinking of one particular, but I'm going to see. Let's start with the land and then we'll throw it back. To oh, you. OK. Well, second theme of the first movement. That's wow. What a phrase. What a you know, it opens up and it's very contrasting with the other one, even the opening. Uh, for me, the most romantic, again, it's very intimate, is the, the, the opening of the second movement. Yeah. I, and maybe it's just me and I, it's, I hear like, um, like the, it's gonna sound very funny, uh, do up from the 50s, you know. <laughs> Boom, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and you <laughs> and you hear that long phrase over it. Of course, it's all in the stratosphere of the range, you know. Uh, all the orchestras, it's very in the higher range and it's very sparse, pizzicati and all that. But it, it leaves a lot of space to sing. But it's such such a beautiful line, and it feels very familiar. It's interesting, Pokofiev. If you're if you don't have to play it, it seems it's very familiar. When you start learning it, playing it, you go like, oh, not so familiar, you know? <laughs> but I, but I, I guess once you've done the whole thing, then it's familiar again. But it's it sounds like there's something familiar about it. And that's the great tradition of, of, our, of the music we play, what we call classical music. There, there's, there's this kind of familiarity, but it's always renewing itself. But uh, for me, the most romantic parts for me are that second theme of that first movement. It's like, oh, it's beautiful. So now I'll throw it over to Timothy. Maybe a f your favorite moment, um, whether it's lyrical and romantic, or maybe if there's something something else you'd like to draw our audience's attention to. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely echo with Alain's um, spot <laughs> in the first movement. I've always found that Prokofiev is such a talented composer he could write something extremely romantic he could be it proves he could write something very classical with his symphony as well in the past and he could also stretch it to the point where it's almost 12 tone so he was just such an incredible composer with so many techniques and yet i feel like there's always a part of him that wanted to never commit to either one which i think is so interesting because you get a little glimpse of everything you get classical you get romantic you get neo-romantic you also get 12 tone at times and Something about his melodies, it is so familiar because I think that there is that uh, inspiration from other composers, but yet he never really goes full, full on Brahms. He never goes full on Mozart. It's always a little bit, I'll touch it with a little melody and it changes and goes somewhere else. Um, so I, I love that part in the, in the first movement. Uh, my 
favorite part uh, also would be right after that happens. It's this creepy crawly moment where the violin goes um, and plays just a C minor triad, da 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 da, and then the the orchestra has da 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 da, da. and just sounds like a. a I would imagine uh, the B-roll shot would be something in Harry Potter or something. Uh, <laughs> so it's just so imaginative. I think what's so powerful about this piece is that it can give every listener a different imagery of 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 whatever they're thinking about. It brings you to fantasy land, brings you into really fantasy land, first of all. And that just opens a whole door of, of images, I think. Yes, we we had talked about this at another point, and you talked about kind of like almost a fairy tale quality, and you know, Prokofiev certainly, you know, you know, he wrote all of these beautiful ballets with these fairy tale tendencies, and um, certainly another composer who who did a lot of you know these kind of fairy tales and ballets is the composer of our first work, um, Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky, and we're doing his serenade for strings. And that's how we're kicking off the program. Then we kind of fill in the gap between these two composers with another great Russian balletic composer and Igor Stravinsky. Um, I would say that the first piece in the program, the serenade for strings, has a very balletic quality. It indeed has mm -hmm. been choreographed. And then the suite for small orchestra, maybe somewhat less, <laughs> less of that, that strain. But maybe, Elena, if you could kind of talk about how, you know, about that journey from the Tchaikovsky serenade for strings and, you know, what ties it to the Prokofiev. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because the Tchaikovsky is at the same time the most Russian, the most uh, uh, international European uh, composer, he, he has both in him. Uh, of course, in the Serenade, uh, we were looking to have works that our word of order was, let's find stuff that sounds big, you know, that for in this COVID time, we have to reduce the orchestration, reduce the number of musicians. But what sounds big, like Tchaikovsky Serenade definitely is you know it's a if you know it's C major it's a big C major we start do si la sala do sol fa mi it's like yes uh, and this of course it's iconic the valse in it is beautiful for me um, I think what gets me is uh, it's always like in all Tchaikovsky symphonies same for me is the inner movement you know except the pathetic that this this pathetic is everything <laughs> actually more the other ones actually the pathetic but in all the rest. You know, even the early symphonies, the first, the second, the inner movements, well, they're little jewels, you know? And the valse, of course, is amazing. And that, that beautiful slow movement, it's, it really sings. You have the soul, his personal soul, and, and it also it's music. And I, that's one thing I like about programming. Sometimes you can take people in another era at a time, a time that does not exist anymore, except in our mind. And in our, in our souvenir, and in our, it's a bit of uh, nostalgia, a little bit, you know. It's it's a, we don't live in this time, the time that Tchaikovsky wrote this. And when you listen to it, it's a time that oh yes, we didn't know that time, but we get to know a little bit of it, a, a truly truly romantic time. And Tchaikovsky, everybody has their um, how can you say? Everybody has their best qualities, right? So Beethoven. Of course, well, no, Beethoven we shouldn't say because he had all the qualities, but let's say, <laughs> let's say a regular, a regular genius, you know, somebody is better at um, developing material and all that. Tchaikovsky, what we could write if we want to talk in uh, terms that uh, we all understand that he could write a tune. So basically Tchaikovsky and, you, and you, even this, in the symphonies, it's not so much development. There is, of course, but it's more like, oh, wow, he's bringing this tune, he's bringing that, wow. Everything is so melodic. Everything is so, wow. And there's technique and everything, but it's always the melody first, always the, the tune first. And that's interesting because uh, sometimes we forget about this when we write music. You know, we get all caught up in the writing of music and, and not the music itself. And for him, it's like, it's just tunes, tunes, tunes. It's, uh, it's really amazing. I mean, uh, for me, it really touches me that way. And, uh, you know, again, the elegy, the, the larghetto, you know, mi da da, a mi fa sol la, do do re mi, fa sol fa sol fa mi re mi. It's like oh wow, and di do do di do do da yippa. You know, I'm singing at a tone too low because my voice is not so good today. But uh, these are movements that uh, they're, they're jewels. The jewels are hidden inside. 
one thing that struck me just as we were as you were talking about this was we could have taken these three composers yeah. and these three categories and switched the categories with the composers. Mm -hmm. We could have had a Stravinsky violin concerto uh, and, and a, a Czech, or a Tchaikovsky violin concerto. We could have had a Stravinsky symphony for just stringed instruments. Yeah. We could have had ballet music from any one of these composers, small yeah. instrumental movements. They, and we would have, have come up with an entirely different concert. Like imagine yeah. basing a concerto around the Stravinsky violin concerto, an amazing piece, an entirely different piece from, from his suite for small orchestra. And it's just fascinating how just, even if you just take these three exact yeah. composers and explore different areas of their output, we could have come up with an entirely different yeah. concert. I'm actually going to ask you, Timothy, have you had the chance to play the Tchaikovsky concerto, the Stravinsky concerto or the, as, as well, and maybe maybe kind of taking a violin-centered lens comparing the three. Absolutely. Yeah, this really excites me because I love Russian music, especially the violin repertoire that they've created. So Tchaikovsky has been a really, really special one in my heart because I've played that um, tons of times at this point. It was really big career, career milestone pieces for me. I brought those to a lot of important debuts and it still sticks to me to this day. Um, Stravinsky, I learned that when I was about 14 years old and okay. it was uh, it was an experience because I didn't understand it at first, but I just, I learned it, I memorized it. So I was like, hmm, maybe one day, but I realized that it's an extremely difficult piece to put together with orchestra because everyone's playing one note and nobody knows where they are because the meter keeps changing. Uh, but it's a very cool piece. It's one of those pieces that I think you need to listen to more than once as both um, an audience member, but also as a musician. I need to listen to that at least like 15 times before I understood it. And then I think that's the beauty of that concerto. You start to, to unravel and you see all the inner workings of it. And that's so cool. Um, then you have the Prokofiev concertos, which we're doing. And I think uh, it kind of falls in between the two, uh, Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky. It's not quite as experimental, I would say, as Stravinsky, but yet it's way ahead of the times of Tchaikovsky. Um, one that we haven't mentioned is Shostakovich, actually. And I think in some ways that is the, the king of, um, of Tchaikovsky's um, kind of next lineage. I think it's much more similar to Tchaikovsky than the Stravinsky or Prokofiev. Yeah. Uh, funny enough, um, Shostakovich is all about repetition. <laughs> uh, it, it's crazy because uh, it sounds so unfamiliar at some times and... Uh, that's it's so different. It's just I, I find it um, Prokofiev and Shostakovich, I think, uh, are, are two really interesting case studies to look into. Um, we're not doing Shostakovich, but uh, just a little foreshadow. Maybe you know, it's, it's funny. <laughs> All, like, I mean, I, I, speaking at least for Elena and myself, I think one of our one of our absolute top two or three favorite composers. And so, yeah, yeah so Shostakovich, anytime, man, it, it'll it'll. It'll, it'll be great. You wrote two concertos. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. But you, you, you know the the link between the we we didn't talk about Stravinsky, but the Stravinsky can be so personal, but at the same time very cham chameleon. You know, uh, and and the way he wrote. So you have the revolutionary with the Rite of Spring, uh, with the Petrushka, and then you have the neoclassic. You know, and I I thought that we 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 should go and find something in his repertoire that is. Uh, more uh, as a pastiche or no, no classic, but uh, to do a link between Tchaikovsky. So we have a language that we know and, and, the, and the Stravinsky as well. They're little show pieces, one after the other, all dances. And, and it's, all, it's uh, uh, all fun and games. It's a lot of fun. But the orchestration, ah, uh, and the note here, note there, the way it's put together uh, rings the bell that we're in another century, you know? We're not in the Romantic era anymore. Even though we know the language, it's presented to us in another way, which links in very well in presenting the Prokofiev after that. Well, thank you so much to both of you for taking the time and introducing our audiences to these three Russian Romantic masterpieces. And we're so looking forward to kind of being on stage and playing for all of you. And Hope, look forward to kind of seeing as many of you in person as we possibly can as soon as we can do it. Thanks for sticking with us. Sure. And hope you hope you enjoy the concert. Bye.